Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so excited that you decided to join us this evening. Today is Monday, November the 14th. Uh, it's 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern, so we're going to go ahead and get started with tonight's uh, webinar. We've got a really a wonderful webinar for you this evening from the Kentucky U.S. Colored Troops Project. We've got Dan Gediman and Denise Payton, and they will be sharing um, the webinar with you here briefly. Uh, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. I want to welcome my co-host, Melissa Barker. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. We're glad you're here. Uh, Melissa is on our board of directors, and she is uh, always gracious to co-host these webinars with me, which makes it fun. Um, we do have an inclusion statement that I always share at the beginning of all of our webinars, and it, the gist of it is, is that uh, we are open to everyone, so regardless of your experience or skill level, uh, you are welcome here, regardless of where you come from. Uh, I was just sharing with our speakers, we have members in all 50 states and in seven international countries, so we've got members all over the all over the Commonwealth, all over the country, all over the world. And if you're researching your Kentucky ancestors, we want this to be your home. Um, we also share our land acknowledgement, which uh, the essence of it is, is that present day Kentucky, uh, before it was the place called Kentucky, it was primarily a homeland of Cherokee, Chickasaw, Miami, Quapaw, Osage, and Shawnee peoples, uh, largely before European settlement. Okay. Um, and then our disclaimer, which is basically that the content of this program, as well as the thoughts, views, and opinions, belong solely to the presenter and host and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Kentucky Genealogical Society. The society doesn't endorse any researcher, product, or record repository. And there may be risk involved in the genealogical research process, and the society is not responsible for your choices, errors, conduct, or outcomes. Okay, with that, um, just a little bit of announcements. Our annual business meeting uh, is November the 17th. You don't want to miss that. Got some exciting announcements that will be shared then. We just do a business meeting once a year, so that one's uh, coming up here this week. Uh, we have a program called Researching in Henderson County, Kentucky on December 1st. That's with Nancy Boyles. Uh, Tricia Anderud, who is also on our board, she's going to be doing a program called Using Maps for Kentucky Research. Uh, on January 11th. You probably want to register for all of these. And then um, just a teaser, next March, we've got John Grenham, who is um, uh, the best researcher probably there is for Irish research. He's going to be doing a program for us on both March 11th and March 3rd. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my co-host, Melissa Barker, to introduce our speakers, beginning with Dan Gediman. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, Dan Gediman is Executive Director of Reckoning Incorporated, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to examine the legacy of slavery in America and to create ways for communities to engage with this information through research projects, media productions, educational curricula, online content, and other means. He is also a public radio producer whose work has been featured on programs such as This American Life, All Things Considered, and Morning Edition. And for Denise, Denise Payton is a professional genealogical researcher for over 25 years of experience. She is a longtime member of the Association of Professional Genealogists, a great group of people, National Genealogical Society, and state and county societies in Kentucky and Ohio. She has contributed research uh, to an episode of uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s PBS series, Finding Your Roots. Denise is a Kentucky Genealogical Society member and co-chair of the nominating committee. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, them to share your slides. All right, thank you so much, Melissa. Are you seeing my? Yes, we are. We look great. Okay, very good. All right. Well, hello everybody. I am Dan Gediman. I'm the executive director of Reckoning Inc. As Melissa mentioned, and um, we're going to tell you a little bit about. I'm going to start by telling you sort of a, giving you a bird's eye view of what uh, our organization is about and what we're doing with this Kentucky U.S. Colored Troops project. So, and some of this may be redundant to things you already know. Um, so my background is as a public radio producer, not as a genealogist, I've sort of backed into this. Um, in producing a public radio series called The Reckoning, um, I interviewed various descendants of a family that was enslaved at Oxmoor Plantation in Louisville. And um, they learned through the research I did into their family, the names of their direct descendants for the first time. And I was even able to find a photograph of their third great grandmother. Um, and this was a huge deal 
for the people that I was giving this information to, and, and you, uh, we just referenced Henry Louis Gates's Finding Your Roots program, and I'm gonna guess that several people on this call have watched that show before. And pretty much every time there is an African-American guest, and uh, Mr. Gates or Dr. Gates is, is able to sh tell them the names of their enslaved ancestors, it's nearly always a huge deal, a very emotional, um, experience for the people in those programs. So when I shared this with her, she said that she wished that this was available to all of, uh, all of her, her friends and family, and indeed all African Americans, and specifically was frustrated that um, all the essential records about uh, enslaved people in this country, and for that matter, all over the world, are held by white people, white families, white institutions, and that it's very difficult for African-Americans to get access to them, and it's expensive to get access to them uh, because they're often behind paywalls and pr proprietary genealogical services like Ancestry. So this project is a direct response to her request, uh, in her words, to help me find my people. So um, white enslavers, uh, so I'm going to just back up for a second. Uh, I, many of you may already know this, but the U.S. Census did not begin to start enumerating African Americans by first and last name who had been enslaved until 1870. So if you want to find out the names of enslaved people before that time, you really are fully dependent on white enslavers' family records. Um, and so, it, and, and they start to mention black enslaved people's names because of money. So it's wills, it's estate inventories, it's lawsuits, bills of sale. But one institution that did regularly record the names of enslaved people's names was the US military during the Civil War. And in Kentucky and other union states where slaveholding was still happening at the time of the Civil War, so that would be Missouri, Maryland, Delaware, uh, portions of Tennessee, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia, um, they uh, made a special effort to note the names of the enslavers of the soldiers who were enlisting in the army. Why did they do this? Because a system of compensation, slave claims compensation, was uh, put into place by the Lincoln administration to compensate, quote, loyal union supporters if they lost enslaved men to fight the war. So they were promised $300 per enslaved man who joined the Union Army, uh, somewhere between five and $6,000 in today's dollars, depending upon uh, inflation and what year it was. So we found a set of ledger books for the state of Kentucky that lists the names of roughly 9,000 enslaved Kentuckians who fought in the Civil War as part of the US colored troops. Um, so these are uh, books, big, wide ledger books, and we'll show you an example of what it looks like in a moment. And they list a bunch of information about these soldiers that's really mission critical for genealogists and that we have not really been able to consistently find anywhere else. So it lists the soldiers by first and last name, birth year, birth location, and the name of their enslavers. Um, to make matters more interesting, these records were and still are miscatalogued at the National Archives. They actually say that there are four uh, in, enslaved soldiers who enlisted in the, in the Army in Missouri, not Kentucky. Apparently, they were all in the same box and they got accidentally digitized. So these documents have been called a Rosetta Stone for African American genealogy because they give us critical information about who these enslaved people were, where they lived, where they were born, who they were enslaved by. And, and it is the best thing so far that we've uncovered that helps African-Americans break through what is often referred to as the 1870 brick wall that keeps African-Americans from finding their enslaved ancestors if they're starting in the present and working backwards. So here's an example of what these ledger books look like. Okay, and you can uh, you can see where the arrow is pointed. It, it it has where born, so it's the it's the county, it's the it's the state, and also how old were they at the time that they enlisted? And there's an enlistment date, so we can infer within a year 
what their year of birth was. There's other information in there that's critical, such as who the quote owner is. So for this particular soldier, it's actually a group of soldiers who are all enslaved by a, at that point in time, a former US Senator from Kentucky named Archibald Dixon from Henderson. I note that you're gonna have a webinar coming up about researching Henderson County. Well, he was, I think, the single largest enslaver in Henderson County. So once we have the name of the enslaver for these soldiers, it opens up an entire world of paperwork that exists for these families, especially if they were major enslavers. So on the, the slide I have here are examples of, in one case, a will, and in another case, an estate inventory for major enslavers in uh, the Louisville area. And what is most important about these wills is that they often mention not just the names of enslaved people, but family units. So it says here, the slaves Jenny and her four children, Bob, Molly, Stafford, and Matthew. So it gives us very specific information about family groups. Um, and these are absolutely critical in terms of being able to follow these family, these for, these families forward in history. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> if it happens much more, I'll mute myself. <laughs> so sorry. Now, once you have the names in these ledgers, we can go looking for military records for these soldiers. So this is an example of actually one of the ancestors of these folks that I started uh, our conversation talking about who were enslaved at the Oxmoor Plantation in, in Louisville. So this man served in the US Army under the name of his enslaver, Archibald Dixon. Um, so he's called here Jim S. Dixon. However, he actually was known under a different name, James Sanders, Jim Sanders. Once we have military files, there's all sorts of other information that is often um, bundled in with the military files, including compensation forms for this compensation process that I mentioned earlier. Why is this important? <clears throat> because in order for an enslaver to get compensation, they had to prove ownership of this soldier. So they have to say exactly how they you know, uh, got that person, essentially. Did they buy them? If so, when did they buy them? To whom did they uh, purchase them from? If they were inherited, who did they inherit them from? So that gives uh, contemporary African-Americans doing this genealogical research another generation uh, of information in the white family oftentimes, or another white family to go exploring, okay? And for African-Americans, this is really important because the more they know the different people that enslaved them, the different families that enslaved that black family over time, it gives them additional hints about why is their family name their family name. So in the case of this particular um, soldier, he's known as Emmanuel Taylor, okay? He, his immediate uh, enslaver is a guy named H.B. Grant, but he in turn got uh, this man, Emmanuel Taylor, from his father-in-law, a guy named Sam Richardson. So you'll note there's no Taylor involved here. So I'm gonna surmise that if we went farther back in Mr. Richardson's family, we would find perhaps a, a woman named Taylor who married into the family, that's her maiden name, and brought some enslaved people with her dowry and they kept that Taylor name. This is again, is complete conjecture, but it's that sort of conjecture that helps us piece together sometimes these antebellum African-American family trees. Now, Catholics. Um, are a group that consistently baptized enslaved people and kept great records of doing that because this is a key part of uh, the, you know, the rites of the Catholic Church. So um, they keep track of this. What you're looking at is, an, is a translation from Latin to English that was done by a um, Catholic priest from the Louisville area who made it his life's work. Uh, and it took him decades to do it, to go through as many of the Catholic Church uh, registers that he could find in the central Kentucky area and translate them from Latin to, to English. And then he did something really quite um, forward thinking. And that was he grouped together in, uh, groups of people who all were enslaved by the same white family. And it gives us a kind of a, a, a quick and dirty way to start to see 
potential family groupings. Um, and so you'll note from like the very first one here, there's a child named Richard Pius. He's the son of Amanda Catherine, who is the servant of Nathaniel Bickett. Um, and we have the, the birth date and the baptismal date. That's a lot right there. Um, and in some cases, we will see not just the name of the mother, but also the name of the father. Okay, so it'll say daughter of so-and-so, servant of so-and-so, uh, and the father's name and who he was enslaved by. So this is another rich treasure trove of information for people trying to piece together um, their enslaved ancestors. And not only Catholics did this, but also uh, many Protestant churches did the same thing. So these are uh, this is a record from the Christ Church Cathedral in Louisville, which is an Episcopal church. Um, and there are a significant number of enslaved children who are baptized uh, who, uh, in the church and are, are in their records. Um, the Baptists did the same, the Methodists did the same, the Lutherans did the same. Um, however, they baptized them at different points in their lives. So, you know, in many cases, they weren't baptized until they were adults or teenagers. Now, getting back to military records, the pension file system, the pension system that the military um, began uh, and, and continued during the Civil War era is incredibly powerful because it gives us a very specific piece of information we wouldn't otherwise have. And that is, what was the name that the soldier served under in the, in the military and what was the name that they were known by in freedom? And so this gives us double the chances of connecting this particular soldier to his descendants, okay? Because we know that he's known by James Sanders, that's what his contemporary relatives would know him as, but all of the records uh, pertaining to his military service and all the hints about who his enslaver was and us being able to get to in re records related to enslaver come through the name James Dixon. The pension files that we can order, let me go back for a sec. Uh, if you look down at the bottom of this um, card, it lists application numbers, certificate numbers, um, the date that these were filed and the state that they were filed from. With this information, we can go to the National Archives and we can order the pension files for these soldiers, which I did for this particular soldier. And there is a, 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 a just a cornucopia of information in these pension files, including health information, which can be very important for African-American families who otherwise are missing you know, extended family information about, for instance, congenital diseases. So it turns out that this man, this soldier, seems to have had a, um, a disease that has been passed down in the men of this family to the present day. And it, it's a rare form of blood uh, cancer, uh, cancer of the blood. And, um, and I have, one of his descendants has this problem. And as soon as he read this description of what his ancestor had, he said, that's exactly how it started with me. Started in my arms and my shoulders and then went to my back. Um, also, it can contain marriage and death records that are not available elsewhere. In other words, um, for this particular man, I couldn't find a death record anywhere else. Neither could I find a, a marriage record for his second marriage um, to this particular woman, Lizzie Williams. So th these filled in other pieces of the puzzle for this particular enslaved family. And in particular, it led them to the grave site where this uh, ancestor was buried. And there is his uh, descendant who has this rare blood disease that he shared with his third great grandfather. Okay, widows also applied for pensions. So it wasn't just soldiers who applied for invalid pensions, but it was also their widows. Um, and so here's an example of a, of a widow pension file. And uh, in these widow pension files, uh, first of all, um, Fold3 has many, many years ago at this point, I think, started to digitize all of the widow's pension files. When last I checked, they were, yeah between 25 and 30% complete. They got slowed down because of the, um, the pandemic. Um, excuse me, we have found 550 roughly pension files for um, US colored troops widows from Kentucky. 
that, and we have them all um, on our website, and we actually got a grant from the American Historical Association to go through every page of all of the pension files and calendar them with summaries of what each document, each individual page, um, what's on that page, what names are mentioned, what are the relationships of the people mentioned in the documents to the pensioner, <clears throat> which in some cases, again, is a widow or a dependent mother, father, or child. Now, we have something very exciting that we that just fell in our lap um, that we'll be talking about in much more detail um, perhaps next year. Um, there is a gentleman who is a former curator of the Patton Museum in Fort Knox um, who uh, basically used the skill set he had acquired as a, as a curator, um, researching the provenance of our armory stuff, you know, guns and rifles and whatnot in his museum, to going through records, um, county courthouse records for enslaved people. Um, and so he has retired about a decade ago and he's made it his life's work to go from court county courthouse to county courthouse throughout Kentucky. And whenever he finds reference to an enslaved person in a will, in an estate uh, inventory, in a divorce proceeding, in a bankruptcy okay. proceeding, in any kind of legal proceeding, he writes down the names and any identifying details about them. If he can figure out who is the parent to whom, who are sibling groups, he puts that all into his database. He's up now to about 65, uh, 66,000 records. 40,000 of them have at least one enslaver mentioned. Uh, 10,000 of them have at least one of the parents mentioned. And there are 18,000 USCT soldiers out of a total of about 23,700 that served, uh, that enlisted in the Union Army or served for, in the Union Army from Kentucky. And 11,000 of those have an enslaver mentioned. So we recently got a grant from the um, Kentucky African American Heritage Commission to put this database online and make it searchable. That will be ready uh, sometime, we hope, by the end of this year on our website, um, which is reckoninginc.org. We also have a, a special website just devoted to the uh, records that we have for soldiers which uh, I'll, I'll put up on the screen in a little bit. It's kyusct.org. Um, and then what we're going to do going forward, and it'll probably take us years to do so, is to um, go through the data that's in the database for the soldiers in this database and uh, build family trees out for these family groups that we've learned about. I want to show you an example of what this database looks like. And uh, since I'm dealing with uh, other genealogists, um, I, I think people will immediately grasp the power of this. If you look in the third column uh, on here, column D, there's a series of numbers. And he's given an ID number to every human being in this database. And if he knows who the parents are, he assigns them a, a one number and then their children that number with a letter attached. So to the right, you'll see Harriet Abel, who's the mother of Albert Abel. Uh, Rose Abel has three children, Jerry, Mary, and an unknown child. And so they are denoted by number. And so we can see these family groups clearly. Then he has kept track of not just one, but sometimes two or three or four or five or six or seven enslavers that over the lifetime of that enslaved person uh, owned them. Okay, so in this particular case, there are a series of people who went through three different hands. Uh, this uh, one gentleman, uh, John Simpson Atherton, and then they went to uh, either his wife when he died, his widow, or a guardian for one of his children, who then eventually get old enough to, uh, to get ownership of them themselves when they reach uh, age, James, Elizabeth, and Milton Atherton. So it's an, an incredible resource that once we get it up and running on our website, I believe is going to be truly game changing for African Americans who are part of the diaspora of those who were enslaved in Kentucky. And I know we have people on this call who are not actually in Kentucky, but who have Kentucky roots. Um, there are potentially millions of people all over the country who descend from these folks from Kentucky who were enslaved here. So my hope is that when we get this up and running, 
uh, in the next couple of months that it's going to be, again, a real game changer for people to be able to examine this data and potentially find their enslaved ancestors. So I'm almost ready to wrap up and turn things over to my colleague, uh, Denise Payton. I wanna just give you sort of an idea of what we've done so far and what we're gonna do going forward. Um, we have most recently been focusing on USCT soldiers from the counties surrounding Louisville. We've gotten through Jefferson County. We're almost uh, through with Nelson County. We're getting ready to go into Bullet, uh, Bullet, sorry, um, uh, Shelby and um, Oldham counties which are uh, north and uh, east of Louisville. Um, we've got a team of volunteer genealogists um, and some paid uh, genealogist staff members. Uh, and we also have some student interns and they are working on, they each adopt a soldier and they research uh, all the available documents for that soldier. They create family trees, which we are putting on to um, ancestry.com uh, for now. And we're getting ready to launch a partnership with FamilySearch.org, who are going to help us um, uh, load into their database um, en masse, you know, hundreds of um, records for these soldiers and their families. Um, we have worked with educators to create curricula built around these USCT soldiers. Um, and all of this data is on our, on our website, kyusct.org. What we have coming up next is, again, we're gonna to try to get through the 11,000 soldiers from Kentucky that are in this uh, database that I mentioned earlier for whom we know they're enslaver. We're sharing this data with scholars uh, from various different uh, disciplines. And we're also talking about potentially putting together a physical memorial to the USC soldiers of Kentucky. This project that we're doing could easily be replicated in other states um, who were border states, where slavery was still legal. And I've already checked with the National Archives. They have ledger books for all these other states. None of them have been microfilmed even. So it would require somebody going to the National Archives, duplicating them, but they, I've talked to the folks there. They're totally game for folks to do that at the, um, um, they have a, a now facilities there where groups of people can come and, and do mass scanning projects. Um, we're also talking to the folks at familysearch.org about getting access to their databases of pension cards for Civil War soldiers. And um, they were, they're just gonna give that to us and allow us to do a data merge or database merge with the database that we already have. Um, and uh, we're also talking about sucking into this database and merging data from Freedman's Bank records that, were, uh, that, are, that they've digitized at FamilySearch. Um, and that's it for me. And I am ready to uh, relinquish my screen and turn things over to my colleague, Denise Payton, who will talk in more detail about what kinds of things can be learned from these documents to help uncover ancestors of African-Americans. Okay, thank you, Dan. I don't know how Could to he... relinquish my screen. <laughs> Here we go. Can you thank see you. my screen? Oh, okay. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to present an overview of our research process and share findings that we have discovered for a few of our USCT soldiers. Our researchers utilize military and other historical sources to document soldier and family profiles. The US descriptive list of colored volunteers or the ledgers that Dan mentioned earlier the compiled military service records and pension index cards lay the groundwork for our soldier research. Unlike some traditional genealogy research that begins with the present and moves back in time, this process begins in the 19th century with the soldiers' military Can records. You? I don't think we can't see your screen yet. There we go. Oh, you can't see it? Now we do. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, should I start over then? No, I'll, I'll just keep going. <laughs> Unlike some traditional genealogy research that begins with the present and moves back in time, this process begins in the 19th century, moving forward to investigate the lives of the soldiers, their family members and associates. The research enables us to reveal the soldiers and their families through life events and stories, 
rather than merely referencing their names and regiments from military sources. This project encompasses the identities and life events of former enslavers as well. Valuable source types comprise the fundamental core of information for documenting African Americans prior to the 1870 federal census enumeration. These next few slides represent examples of key historical sources that when retrieved provide us with essential information relevant to our USCT soldiers. This is the digital image of the pension index card for John Hall. John enlisted under the surname Hall, which was the surname for of his enslaver. The value of this pension index card is the fact that he was identified as John Stubblefield, which is the surname that he used after his military service. And as it turns out, through our research, we, we discovered that Stubblefield was a family surname that he used prior to enlisting. In addition to providing data regarding his application date, type of pension, company, and regiment, we've learned about his alias name. Uh, we see here where his service information was listed. He, was in, he served in Company K of the 109th USC Infantry. This, in, this information is valuable to researchers so that they can corroborate the evidence with other, other military sources for the respective soldier to ensure that they're looking at the accurate information. In June of 1891, John filed for an invalid for invalid pension benefits. He was assigned a certificate number which indicates that the army approved his pension application. He filed from the state of Kentucky. So we have two key pieces of information that in 1891, John resided in Kentucky and he lived at least as late as June 30th of 1891. The information from this card enabled us to retrieve crucial marriage and other vital records and census enumerations that provided the identity of his wife, his children, a sibling, and the names of John's parents. This is the digital image of a Freedman's Bank card for John H. Keene, who was a former USCT soldier. The Freedman's Bank was chartered by Congress in 1865 to benefit former enslaved individuals and white citizens who were seeking banking services that were easily accessible to them. These bank cards provide the current date that the account was applied for the current date when the uh, account was applied the current residence of the individual john was living in louisville kentucky he was also born in louisville his age was 34 when he applied and he was employed as a porter at the louisville national louisville and nashville railroad John's wife's name was Fanny, and in 1873, they had one son who was named George. This information here provided uh, data for about his family. Benjamin Keene was his father. He was deceased by 1873, and Mahala Simmons was his mother. There was no notation saying that she was deceased, so this gave us an opportunity to further investigate her to determine if we could find any more information about John and his family. He stated that he had a brother and sister, but did not name them. So further investigating Mahala Simmons, she was located in the 1860 Jefferson County federal census with her second husband, whose surname was Simmons. They were both enumerated as free persons of color by 1860. We were not able to determine the circumstances under which Mahala was manumitted, but we know that by 1860 she was free. 
and living in the adjacent household in the 1860 census was Matilda Dixon and her husband, Lewis, and two small children. Further investigation showed that Matilda was the daughter of Mahala and the probable sister of John King. So we have had it uh, four or five additional family members for John King through searching his mother, Mahala Simmons. By 1870 and 1880, Mahala and Matilda and their families still resided in Louisville. And actually in 1880, they were living in proximity to John King and his family. So this is a bank application, an application for a bank account but as you can see, it provides us with a little mini family tree. And the other significant part of this information is that John was the informant for this information and he was either a witness to what he was reporting to the clerk or he had actually participated in the events. These are excerpts from a Freedmen's Bureau claim memoranda that was submitted by Lucy Wells. Her intent was to validate that she was the mother of Anderson Johnson, who served in Company K of the 107th USC Infantry. Anderson died during his service, and we believe that Lucy went to the Freedmen's Bureau branch in Louisville to obtain validation that she was, or to prove that she was Lucy, she was Anderson Johnson's mother so that she could prepare to present a formal pension application to the government. She lived in Indianapolis, Indiana at the time. This was in the early 1870s. There were two witnesses who lived in Louisville who attested to her identity. And she presented a letter of notification, which was probably sent to her when her son Anderson died. The second part of the affidavit or the memoranda shows that Berryman Johnson identified Lucy Wells as the mother of their son, Anderson Johnson. So that was further validation of her identity. These Friedman Bank and Freedmen's Bureau records provide information relevant to individuals that may not have been documented in any other historical record source. Uh, the, the key here is that these records were documented beginning in 1865 at the close of, at the end of the Civil War. Some of the records may actually be documenting life events prior to 1865. So we're looking at a window uh, of several years prior to the 1870 federal census, which is the first census in which formerly enslaved individuals were recorded by name. So these two federal record sets are really important to us in the, in the research of African Americans, not only former soldiers, but African Americans who were formerly enslaved. This is Jacob Standerford, AKA Finley. He was born in 1837 or 1838 in Jefferson County and enlisted in Company F of the 108th USC Infantry. He mustered out of the military on, in March, 1866 at Vicksburg, Mississippi. Jacob migrated to Indianapolis, Indiana sometime around 1868 where he lived for the remainder of his life. He filed for an invalid pension in 1888. By the 1900 federal census in Indiana, Jacob was reportedly a resident of the U.S. National Home for Disabled Soldiers in Marion, Indiana, which is where he died in February of 1904. Because he enlisted under the surname Standiford, he is buried as Jacob Stanford. Uh, the military clerks seem to insist on misspelling the, the surname Standiford. 
He's buried in the Marion National Cemetery in Indiana. The Home for Disabled Soldiers documented that Jacob's wife was a resident of Indianapolis in 1904 when he died, uh, but they neglected to provide us with her given name. They just named, called her Mrs. Jacob Stanford. This is a general affidavit document that was submitted by Jacob in Indianapolis in June of 1894. And the information contained in this <clears throat> helps to document that he enlisted as a private and he was promoted to corporal in the 108th. More importantly, this states that Jacob and his parents were known by the surname Finley and Finley was their referenced family name prior to him enlisting in the service. This also states that he was enslaved by someone with the surname Stanford uh, and that he enlisted under the Stanford surname. So in just this one document, his uh, surname was spelled as Stanford and Standerford. His uh, monthly pension amounted to $12 per month, according to this 1894 document. This is Elisha D. Standiford, who was the documented enslaver of Jacob. He was reportedly born on the 28th of December, 1831 in Kentucky. Elisha attended St. Mary's College near Lebanon, Kentucky and graduated from the Kentucky School of Medicine. He practiced medicine for a time and later pursued agricultural and other enterprises such as banking and other types of management. He was a member of the Kentucky Senate in 1868 and 1871. Elisha was president of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad Company between 1875 and 1879. The Louisville International Airport was originally named Standerford Field. Elisha married Mary Neal in 1853 Lily Smith in 1876, and Lorena Scott in 1887. He was the father to several children with his first and second wives, and he died in July 1887 and is buried in Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville. This is Wesley Watson, who was born between 1827 and 1829, probably in Virginia. He enlisted in Company B of the 125th United States Colored Infantry in February 1865 in Louisville. Wesley mustered out of the military at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas on the 20th of December, 1867 with his company and regiment. According to his enslaver, who was Lawrence Young, Wesley had a half brother, John Dickinson, who also served in the USCT and who was also enslaved by Lawrence Young. Lawrence Young reported that he purchased Wesley with his unnamed mother in 1831 and raised him until he enlisted in the service. Wesley and his wife, Maddie Alexander, began a relationship prior to 1854 and were parents to seven documented children. Maddie died in Louisville in September, 1896. Wesley and several children resided in the Springdale Precinct in Jefferson County in proximity to where he was raised during enslavement. He also, after, after being just discharged from the military, resided on the young property for the duration of his life. Wesley died in October 1911, living in Springdale in Jefferson County. This is an 1858 map of that area. The outlined area here shows uh, Lawrence Young's property and the property of one of his sons, William Young. This X here, according to documentation, is an approximate location of where uh, Wesley Watson and his family lived in a cottage on that property. 
The 1870 Jefferson County Federal Census showed Wesley Watson enumerated in proximity to Lawrence Young and his family and William Young and his family. So the proximity of these households in the census infers that these three families resided on common or adjacent properties in the same Spring, Springdale precinct. This also corroborates evidence found in Lawrence Young's will relative to Wesley Watson's residence on the Young property. Lawrence Young was born about 1794 in Virginia. He was a resident of Jefferson County as early as 1823 when he married Eliza Johnston White. They were parents to five children by 1850. Lawrence was enumerated in the, eight, in the federal census with real estate valued at $57,000. This likely included the value of his personal property as well. The 1850 federal census form did not include a column to list uh, personal property values. By 1860, Lawrence Young's real estate was valued at $70,000 and his personal property was valued at $29,000. Between 1850 and 1860, it appears as though the maximum number of enslaved individuals that Lawrence held was 39. In addition to Wesley Watson, Lawrence was enslaver to at least nine other USCT soldiers that we have researched thus far. They were the four Craven brothers, Allison, Horace, Prime, and Rice, John Dickinson, Wesley's half-brother, George and Jesse Johnson, who were likely siblings, and Nelson White. Lawrence Young reportedly conducted a private school in the Middletown area close to the Springdale Precinct. Earlier in life, he studied law at Transylvania College, but opted for a career in teaching, agriculture, and horticulture. Young was reportedly the first person to record climatic observations for the Smithsonian Institute in 1842. <clears throat> this is an excerpt of Young's 1873 Last Will and Testament, and I've outlined item six, which is relevant to Wesley Watson. And it reads, it is my wish that Wesley, who is the most trusty boy I, I have raised, should be employed in the family so long as he is willing and able to work at reasonable wages, and that so long as he is in the employ of the family, he be allowed to occupy the cottage he is in at the rental of $50 per annum. Abner Troutman was born about 1831 in Virginia or Nelson County, Kentucky. His historical documents uh, list both locations as his birthplace. His, he was documented as Abner and Albert, although we think that Abner was his formal given name. He enlisted in Company H of the 107th United States Colored Infantry at Elizabethtown on the 30th of August, 1864. A couple of days later, on the 1st of September in 1864, he was mustered in at Louisville and mustered out of the military service at Washington, D.C. on the 23rd of November, 1866. Abner was married to Caroline first by 1866 and Lottie by 1880. He was the father of several children from both unions. Abner was enumerated as a farmer with his family in 1870 and 1880, Hardin County, Kentucky, living in or near Elizabethtown. By 1900, Abner resided in Indianapolis, Indiana. In his census listing, he was the only one listed in the household uh, there were no family members present on that census listing. Uh, it's, it's unknown whether his family was transitioning uh, from Kentucky to Indiana, 
but by 1904, Abner and Lottie Troutman were both listed in the same household in the Indianapolis City Directory. Abner died on the 8th of February, 1905, and is buried in the national section of Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis, Indiana. His cause of death was not listed on any burial registers that we have uh, retrieved thus far. The team member who researched Abner, though, has made a trip to Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis and was able to take a picture of his headstone. Warren L. Wilhite Troutman was the documented enslaver of Abner. He was born in 1806 in Kentucky. He was the son of Leonard Troutman and Katie Wilhite. Warren married Sarah Lutz in August 1829. They were parents to 10 children, six of whom survived to adulthood. In 1850, Warren was enumerated as a farmer in the federal census of Nelson County with real estate valued at $8,000. He was listed as an enslaver of 20 individuals, one of whom matched the gender and approximate age of Abner Troutman, our soldier. Again, in 1860, Warren was enumerated in Nelson County as a farmer with real estate valued at $15,400 and personal property valued at $15,660. He was listed as an enslaver of 16 individuals, again, one of whom matched the gender and approximate age of Abner Troutman. In addition to being a farmer, Warren was a proprietor of a store west of the Boston precinct in Nelson County which is the area where the Troutmans lived and uh, owned property. In 1867, Warren Troutman died, according to the Troutman Families of Kentucky article, which was published in the Filson Club History Quarterly in 1950. This is the same 1882 map that we saw on the previous slide. I zoomed in to show uh, where Frank Troutman, Troutman resided. He was reportedly the, the son of Warren who lived in the Troutman family home place. His brother, William Troutman, married Kate Woods and Elizabeth Starks. Mary Malvina, his sister, married James W. Doherty. And reportedly, the brothers Leonard, John, and Warren Wilhite did not marry. So these selections demonstrate how our research transforms the names of individuals into life stories of men and associated family members. The USCT research informs about the general community by opening doors to discovery through diverse sources about soldiers and their families and former enslavers and their families. The project provides the opportunity to conduct research relevant to Kentucky and share it with potential descendants, educators, historians, and other interested parties. This research project has revealed diverse historical sources that aid in the discovery about African-American lives and that of their associates in Kentucky. And lastly, if you're interested in volunteering to do genealogical research with the project, uh, follow this link, kyusct.org. And there's a tab that says, get involved. Click on that and you'll see more information about volunteering for the project. And that's it for me. Denise, it's, uh, thank you so much. This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you both to you and Dan. You guys have been really busy doing some really important uh, work that I think is probably going to benefit a lot of people. So thank you so much. And with uh, that, we'll take a few questions. If folks have questions for uh, Denise or for Dan, if you just want to enter them in the uh, questions uh, portion on GoToWebinar, um, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. 
So um, let's see here. And uh, I'll tell you, while we Can are- I just back out of this presentation, Chris? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it back. Um, okay. Take it back from you. Uh, while we're waiting on that, um, Dan, I just, um, not to uh, get the story out there before it's all done, but, um, you know, we sometimes share little nuggets with the community that's here about things we're working on. Um, do you want to just talk briefly about the the little project that we collaborated on with the um, the uh, the Filson and the Jefferson yes. County Clerk's Office? And can, yes. can you yes. share with, share a little bit of that because I think that might be relevant to a lot of people. Sure, absolutely. So what Chris is talking about is um, during the course of doing research for this larger uh, reckoning project. Um, I stumbled on the fact that there were a set of microfiche um, uh, with about 14,000 pages of estate inventories for Jefferson County, where Louisville is located, <clears throat> that have never been um, digitized before. So they only exist as a set of microfiche at the, fil at the Filson, and then the original paper records exist, uh, I guess, at the county courthouse. And so... Um, it occurred to me that these would be ripe for digitizing and that then we can turn them over to some combination of a volunteer, uh, you know, a crowdsourced project using something like From the Page, which has been used fruitfully for other transcription projects for, um, for big digital humanities projects. Um, and also this fellow that we mentioned earlier, this uh, curator of the Patent Museum, his name is Charles Lemons. Uh, this guy works about 60 hours a week just going through archival records and transcribing them and putting them in his database. So um, he's already said he's ready to go. If we can get him these digitized estate inventories, he will go through them page by page. And whenever he finds groupings of enslaved people, he will put them into his database. Now, why it's important for him to do this is because he may have uh, those members of that same family found in some other archival source. So this is an example of how <coughs> the, what is it? The, uh, the, the, the sum is greater, the, the greater than the sum of its parts. The, the, the more different archival um, data sets can be put together into one, which is the power of ancestry, essentially, and family search, and these other uh, uh, ancestry-oriented genealogy websites. But here is a, a, a microcosmic version of that same phenomena, just with um, uh, wills and estate inventories in Jefferson County. Um, Previously, he uh, we found the wills for Jefferson County, which were uh, on microfilm by uh, the the Microsoft the sorry the Family Search people who are have since put them up on their website. So now we have both the wills for the people who left wills behind, and now we have estate inventories for people who died uh, without a will. And so collectively, we're going to have this enormous database of antebellum records of enslaved people who show up as property in some combination of wills and estate inventories. And um, K Kentucky Genealogical Society is 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 an integral partner to this because you all have a relationship with Family Search as well. And uh, we've got this lovely partnership between Family Search, Reckoning, and um, uh, and and the Genealogical Society. Did that pretty much cover it, Chris? Yeah, and I mean, I think the, the neat thing about that is, you know, it's 110 years of these records, and it is, you know, Jefferson County is the largest county in Kentucky, so there's going to be some gems in there, and what I thought was neat about it, too, was just the collaborative effort between Reckoning, the Filson, Jefferson County Clerk's Office, Family Search, the Genealogical Society, all kind of just pulling together to each do their little part to make it happen, and um so I'm sure there are other opportunities like that that are going to come along. And um, we're, I think, just enthusiastic to support, um, be supporters of the work that you're all doing. So um, lots of accolades are coming in and I've got a couple of questions. Um, OK, so Trisha Barb, uh, we're just saying appreciate all the hard work you're all doing. Um, this is fantastic. The search continues. Um, Teresa asked, um, have you? Uh, stumbled upon any records for Trigg County, and uh, let's see here. Yeah, 
so, so uh, I'll just say that this this um, Charles Lemons database that I was talking about, and, and we're just scratching the surface of what is available in this. He's got, you know, he's up to 66,000 records. Um, and there are records for 108 counties. So it, it, there were only 110 counties in Kentucky at circa the 1860 census. And so this is basically all of Kentucky that's represented in this database to some degree. And um, so I can, if you, if I had a minute, I could go look in it and tell you how many records we have for Trigg County. Um, but I'm going to guess that it's quite a few because I've done research on that part of the state. And um, uh, I think there, I know there was a significant amount of slave holding there. So um, uh, I would have to take a minute and go d pull up this database and look at it to see what numbers we have for Trigg, but I I'm pretty sure they're considerable. And I mean, I think the important point for folks to know about all of that is the the work that Charles Lemons has been doing, you know, he he's sort of old school. He's had it like on this database on his desktop yeah. and he prints out these copies and takes them to these public libraries. But it is if you aren't able to access that information, it's really hard to get a hold of it. So what um, Dan and the Reckoning is going to be doing, they're putting this on a website. So it'll be accessible to folks all over the world. It'll be That's wonderful. Right. So yeah, so that's a, we, that's a game changer. And we've yeah. already started the process. We're working with a web developer who's, I think, like days away from showing us the, the, the first draft of what he's come up with. But it's going to be searchable in a variety of different ways. Um, you'll be able to search by the, the, the name of the enslaved person. You'll be able to search by the enslaver. Um, so by the way, there's a secondary benefit to this for those people who may descend from enslavers, um, you would have a pretty comprehensive um, database to look up the names of your ancestors, right? And you can see, did they enslave people? And not only will you get a yes, no answer to that question, you'll have a granular answer to that question. Yes, my ancestor enslaved these 16 people, and they're related to one another in these family groupings, and you'll have the opportunity to then, you know, see if they exist in the 1870 or 1880 census um, and what might have become of them. Uh, so it, 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 we believe this will be of greatest import to African Americans because again, it helps them hop over this, this uh, 1870 uh, brick wall that African American genealogists talk about all the time, but also it will have value for, um, for white folks who uh, will be able to, to get information about that part of their family history, which may not be the most fun thing in the world to learn about, but if you really want a 360 you know, uh, degree uh, vantage point of what, what was going on with your family during the antebellum era, well, this is a part of it if they were from Kentucky. Absolutely, and you know, I uh, just personal experience, I was, I've researched a lot of my family. I've got family in 40 Kentucky counties that I've identified going back, coming from Virginia. And um, I found one set of enslavers and they were actually Catholics living in Washington County, which really kind of, you know, when I first learned about this, I was like, Catholics were enslaving, you know, and then I, the more I researched, I learned about it, but I'm looking forward to finding out this information because I want to oh. know who these folks were that they, it was a couple, um, and I found it in a probate record, and their last names were Brown, you know, but, and that's all I've been able to discover is I have the date, the location, the name, the, the surname, but um, I'm looking forward to learning more about these folks, and, okay. you know, like, do they have descendants, you know, and um, so, well, I will uh, just tell you that that that, that uh, Mr. Lemons did extensive research in the Catholic triangle there of Nelson, Washington, and Marion counties, which is where he's based. He's in Nelson County, so he's got you know tens of thousands of records from that period, from that area, um, and he he too went to uh, the Catholic records, uh, the Catholic Church records, and not just Catholic Church records, but but the religious orders that were there the Catholic um, colleges and um, uh, you know, boarding schools that were located there who also enslaved people, individual churches enslaved people. So he's got um, all that information baked into this thing. So there will be fruitful, very, very fruitful um, uh, information there for people who are 
uh, have any Catholic ancestors? So um, this question come up uh, several times in different forms, um, but I'll just ask it the way that Medina is asking it. So she, as she's doing research, she uh, stumbles upon different um, names and locations of uh, folks who were enslaved. Um, what should she do with it? Is, is there a way for her to share that or um, yes. did she get it? Lemon or question. I'm standing question. Thank you. So um, if you go to our website, um, we, well, I'll just, this is a little confusing. We have two websites, but our main website is reckoninginc.org, reckoninginc.org. There's a, there's a contact link there. Um, you can reach us through there and let us know what, what records you have. We get contacted it seems like once a week at least by different people. We just got one yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, saying that they've got information about a particular ancestor, or in some cases they say that they got their pension file, their military pension file. Um, and so people are sending this stuff to us and we would love to be, our goal is to be sort of the one-stop shop, kind of a clearinghouse for all known information about enslaved people in Kentucky. Um, and so I'll put a call out right now to anybody on this call. If you have access to any kind of family papers, uh, and this is both white and black families, by the way, because if you have like, you know, ledger books or letters or other ephemera, paper ephemera that have been passed down in your family that mention enslaved people, well, we sure would love to see that. But also for African-American families, if you've done some research and you have data about a particular ancestor, uh, especially who, who served in the Army, uh, we would love, love, love to get copies of that. And again, you can contact us through um, our website, reckoninginc.org, and click on the contact link. I'll also be happy to give out my uh, email address at the, at the end of this if you'd like as well. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Joanne Fort, and this one might be for Denise. Um, uh, Joanne asks, would an enslaved person who escaped from a plantation in Tennessee and join the U.S. Colored Troops be listed in the files if he joined the Kentucky U.S. Colored Troops? Yes, he would. He would be listed because he enlisted in Kentucky. Uh, he should show up in our records somewhere. But there's a flip he enlisted, side. actually. But there's a flip side to that. And this is especially true for um, the people who were enslaved in the southern counties on the border of Tennessee. Many, many of those folks who so are talking about like Christian County and um, uh, uh, the various counties in, in Western Kentucky in particular, people were crossing over to go to the Clarksville area and enlist there. In far Eastern, uh, Southeastern Kentucky, people were crossing over into Eastern Kentucky towns and enlisting there. Um, mm -hmm. So, so you, you may have ancestors who don't show up in as, as Kentucky soldiers, they show up as Tennessee soldiers in one of these regiments that formed along the border. Ditto, uh, there, we don't have an exact number, but clearly there were, I'm going to guess somewhere, maybe as many as 10,000 uh, black men from Kentucky who crossed the border into either Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, Southern Ohio, uh, Tennessee, West Virginia, over to Missouri. <clears throat> And enlisted in various regiments there. When it when it was no, when it, at the period of time there was a period of almost a year and a half, where you could enlist in the U.S. Army in other states, especially northern states, but you couldn't enlist in Kentucky. Kentucky did not allow enlistment for either white, either free or enslaved black people until June of 1864. Whereas in other states, uh, right after the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, January 1st, 1863, you could enlist, for instance, in Massachusetts or in New York or Pennsylvania. Right. And now, I one... just reviewed a soldier today who was born in Kentucky and enlisted in Tennessee into the 6th Heavy Artillery. Yes. And he showed up in our database, yeah. Yep, very okay. common. Here's one that, uh, when you were referencing, um, Denise, the the soldier, um, I believe it was the Standiford, uh, he had multiple, he had those three surnames on the one document. So this right. one kind of is up that alley. Uh, Barb asked about aliases, and she's trying to research someone, but um, 
she's having a hard time locating the pension record due to an alias. Any suggestions? Uh, one suggestion would be to uh, to try to retrieve the pension index card because what we find is that the index card may be listed under the name that the soldier enlisted under or enlisted by. And once you pull up the pension index card, then many times it will have the alias written there, just as with John Hall and John Stubblefield, and then the example that, that uh, Dan showed. So I would look for the Civil War, in the Civil War US, the US Civil War pension index databases in Ancestry or Fold 3, and look for under the name that you have to see if there's an alias listed on the pension index card. So can I make one suggestion? And that is that um, um, family search, so fold three, the problem with fold three is it, it's garbage in, garbage out. You have to put in the precise wording of a name or it will not show you a, you know, a, an alternate sp spelling or something like that. Uh, and also, to the best of my knowledge, they're not indexing the alternate names. Whereas Ancestry does, Family Search does. Um, and one of the things, one of the projects we're working on with Family Search is for them to give us all of the, um, the, the, the pension index card uh, data. And in particular, all the pension in index card data for anybody who served in the unit with the word colored in it. And all of the black soldiers, all the regiments had the word colored in it. So it's, you know, the 122nd colored infantry regiment, the 5th colored cavalry, the 8th colored heavy artillery regiment. They always, all have the word colored. And so um, what we want to do is be able, and by the way, they index both the, the primary name and the um, also known as AKA name. Um, so... And, and I will mention this, that we did a little experiment um, with Family Search. They gave me um, a selection of about um, a thousand soldiers um, from the pension card uh, index who had alternate names, okay? And I looked at those and about um, 80 to 90% of them were African-American. So in other words, this was just a random selection of a thousand soldiers who, who had a pension where they had an alternate name. And out of that group of a thousand, about 80 to 90% were black. So that tells me, I don't know this absolutely for a fact, but based on that, uh, that specific um, sample, um, it sure seems like an awful lot of black soldiers served under one name and lived under a different name. So that's why these these pension index cards, I can't stress this enough, might be the like most important piece of data that somebody might look at. Um, because you may even know, we, I, I, I know a family, the one that I mentioned earlier that showed the picture of the guy at the gravesite. They knew, they always knew they had an ancestor named James Sanders who served in the military and they even knew where he was buried, but they couldn't find his gravestone. They went up and down. This one gentleman who's in that picture, he went up and down the rows of that cemetery, that military cemetery, with his grandfather and with his father, trying to find this grave. And it was only when they got the pension card information, which again, the only reason I found it is because I was I knew to look for the alternate name because I knew the name of his enslaver. And it's the so the just to put a fine point on it, the power of what we're doing is we're going from the past down to the present. Whereas most African-Americans who are trying to do their family tree, or indeed all of us, are starting in the present and going backwards to the past, okay? So what we're trying to do is build family trees from the past downward. And we're hoping that by publishing a whole bunch of these, tens of thousands of these over time, that people, their, their, their family trees will bump into our family trees on these various platforms, on Ancestry, on Family Search, And those platforms themselves will give you a hint and say, hey, we think we have a new ancestor for you. Click here. That's great. That is <laughs> awesome. Um, all right, well, uh, I think we got through all the questions. Uh, before we wrap up, we do have a door prize uh, for this evening. And tonight we are giving away, uh, let me pull it up here. 
African Founders, The How Enslaved People Expanded American Ideals. It's a new book out by David Hackett Fisher. Uh, David Hackett Fisher wrote Albion Seed, which if uh, you're a genealogical researcher doing research in Kentucky or the United States, you need to you need to know about that book because it tells you a lot about how things are and why things are the way they are. But he has recently um, uh, published this book, African Founders. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to we're going to do early bird gets the worm, and so whoever showed up first to the webinar is going to get uh, tonight's door prize. And let's see, based on arrival time, the first person to show up was Deborah Middleton. So Deborah, congratulations. You won uh, African Founders in, uh, I know you're a new member, and so we will uh, send that to you from Amazon. You'll be getting that directly from them, and I uh, hope you enjoy that book. Okay, uh, before we wrap up, uh, Dan, Denise, anything you wanna share before we, we say goodnight? Well, I just wanted to give out our website a few more times. So uh, the, 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 our sort of mothership website is reckoninginc.org. And if you go there, it'll take you to all the different things that we have available on our on our website that would be of interest to you, genealogically speaking. Um, and by the way, we're getting ready to post in the next couple of weeks um, all of the church records that we have, uh, all the enslaved uh, baptismal records for about um, 20 parishes around Louisville, the Louisville area. Um, so if you go on our website and um, sign up to get our newsletter in particular, we'll let you know when those new features are going to be on our website and also when we're going to publish this Charles Lemons database. You can also contact us there if you have queries and you can get involved with us as volunteers. Click on the Get Involved uh, link and um, we are always looking for more genealogical researchers to help us with this enormous project that we've taken on. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Denise, anything you want to share? Yeah, I just share for those who are in Louisville or close to Louisville, we just opened an exhibit, uh, the KYUSCT project, and it's it's featuring soldiers from the 108th USC Infantry. So if you get a chance to go by there uh, before the end of the year, you can view our, our exhibit. Actually, it's going to be up through the end of Black History Month. I just found out. Oh, and this is at okay, the Youth great. 101 African American Museum, which is on um, uh, First Street in downtown Louisville. Yeah, 124 North First Street. There you go. Wonderful, and uh, you know something I learned tonight. You know, I'm a I'm a uh, Louisville native, and I always flew into Standerford Field uh, whenever I'd fly in and out of the city, and uh, I, I now realize like how it got its name just from the information you shared Denise so thank you uh -huh. uh, it, the fact is not lost on me though that it's now called Muhammad Ali International Airport so uh, times are changing and thank you all both for um, wonderful presentation sharing all this information and uh, more importantly thank you for the work that you're doing it's very important and uh, it's going to help a lot of people so thank you and thank you uh, for having us thank yeah. you Chris and you know if as things develop and if you will have updates in the future you know stay in touch and uh, we can always have you come back and talk to the society oh, so right. thank you we'll do uh, thank okay. you sounds good so uh don't miss our annual business meeting folks it's on november the 17th We've got some great updates we'll be sharing also uh some of our program calendar for 2023 we'll be sharing some of that We've got some great door prizes so if you haven't registered that's a that's free you can just register on the website um there will be a a wonderful uh, program on researching in Henderson County on December the 1st. Uh, and uh, with that, we're going to just say thanks, everybody. Hope you all have a good evening. Um, if you would ever want to volunteer with our society, you feel free to do so at kygs.org slash volunteer. If you have any feedback, suggestions, ideas for future um, webinars, just drop me an email at president at kygs.org. Everyone have a good evening. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.